Hello, Matt. Uh, welcome to episode 64, I think. Yeah, 64, Going Live with Good Soil. And uh, this is the second week in a row we are doing it in conjunction with Tesla Tuesdays, the new Tesla Tuesdays Twitter spaces on Twitter, which is, um, uh, I think like a, today, it's going to be an eight or nine hour long spaces of just nonstop Tesla talk. And we have a segment here. So we're doing both live on our YouTube channel and on spaces. And just a disclaimer at the very beginning, so everyone knows none of this is investment advice. Um, we are not registered investment advisors. And um, we are just talking about our opinions. And we'll talk about Tesla and some other stocks and the macro market. And it's just our opinions and what we're thinking about the markets and stocks. And it's not investment advice. How's it going, Matt? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, Don't, going well. As we're talking, Tesla's around three eleven and fifty cents. So it's, uh, I, f I think this is the highest it's been since the split, right? I don't think it's broken three ten in regular trading hours, at least um, since the split happened. So this is kind of, it feels like a new all time high, but it's not, you know. So it's it's uh, it's exciting, and and in a time when the macro market is down, like you said, it's just been a, a rough macro market. The Fed has their uh, second day of their first day of the meeting is today. Tomorrow is just when their meeting ends and they come out with their announcement and Powell speaks and such. And everyone already knows what they're going to do. 75 basis point hike. Well, we were looking at the probabilities right from the swaps market. What was the probabilities for the for the mark rate hikes? Almost. Yeah. So I, I, quick aside, there, I'm getting a lot of comments that uh, can't hear my sound on YouTube. I don't know. We, we got a initial message that the sound was good so let me know in the comments if you, if you can hear me now i switched over my mic again so okay yeah let us know in the comments can anyone hear matt on youtube yet can anyone hear matt matt yeah, is good okay. all right good matt is good yeah, i'm gonna i'm gonna blame farzad because farzad like spent half an hour <laughs> kind of like getting my my thing hooked up and he's like you got to download the software obs so i download that software and every time i use that <laughs> It cuts out, so I don't know. Yeah. It's tough to blame Farzad, not me. No, he's great. Farzad's been very helpful to a lot <laughs> yeah, of us he, in the community getting us set up. So really appreciate your help, Farzad. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So so we were looking at the the, the probabilities. <laughs> I think um, you know, after Jackson Hole, I think it was like a 50% probability, roughly, of like a 50 basis point hike, um, and 50 of 75 basis points, somewhere in that in that range. Uh, but now, you know, after market has kind of digested, you know, uh, Powell's comments there, and especially the, the the hotter than expected CPI print last week, it's now 81% chance of a 75 basis point hike, which we'd find out tomorrow, and a 19% chance of a 100 basis point hike. So, um, you know, really, the that's that's I think what's driving the markets down so much in the last couple of weeks is just, you know, expectations for both higher rates and for a, probably a prolonged period of higher rates is, is really what's what's uh driving this this bad news i think um yeah. so i don't know i mean what's what's your thought everyone's talking you know there's been a lot of news of kathy wood and elon saying like they're going too aggressive and they're backward looking uh, what, what do you make of, of the fed's kind of plans here yeah 75 basis points i hope that's what it is because if they do 100 19 percent that's that's not you know that's the odds the markets are giving it right now that's that's nothing to snicker at you know 90 percent substantial and yeah. if they do 100 basis points tomorrow oh my gosh i'm worried that the market could really get rattled and drop five the nasdaq could drop five plus percent maybe eight maybe high, more than we've ever seen in a long time in one day i feel like you know that just i feel like the market's just ready to like freak out if the if the, yeah. <laughs> the feds like are oh, we're going to basis points you know this time and 75 basis next time or something you know oh no we're going up to like volcker type interest rates and <laughs> it'll freak everyone out um so i hope that's not the case i i if it's 75 basis points depending on the language with the statement i think um we're it's possible we see a, a you know a slight rally um but you just don't know uh the rally might just be short lived. It could be like one of those days where we're up two or three percent, and then the next day we're back down three percent. The next day, you know, it's just hard to say. We're just kind of in this weird no man's land, waiting for 
more clarity from the Fed. They give a lot of mixed signals right now. And people have been asking us, like, what do you think the Fed's going to Everyone's unsure. You, you can tell how uncertain, how mixed signals there are by how many people, the frequency of people asking in the investment community that should people that should have some view themselves. But those people asking us, like a lot of people are asking, like, what do you think the Fed's going to do? What's happening with the macro market? Everyone's uncertain because the Fed is just giving lots of mixed signals here. Yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of funny. What was it like a, a month or a month and a half ago? You know, it was all, you know, we're going to let the data drive our decisions and we're going to be very, you know, kind of like, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, data dependent and, you know, we'll be measured in our approach and markets like that. And then they're like, no, the markets, that was like too much of a move. So now we're going to like, they really changed tone completely and just became, you know, inflation hawks. And and like, I, I think it's really just words <laughs> that have driven up. Yeah the or driven down the the stock market right now and uh, it, it does seem to me that it's it's more likely than not that the the concerns over inflation are going to be a bit overhyped uh which will lead to increased rate hikes if if you know the fed takes this seriously which you know in the second half of next or the first half of next year i, I think could be very detrimental to the uh to the economy so i really hope there's not like a, a serious economic slowdown um if, if these rate hikes continue, I think it could, you know, really push into, you know, more kind of significant recession type territory. So, um, yeah. I, like the economy, the rest, like employment and, you know, GDP and everything seems like it's, it's relatively strong actually. Uh, but mm -hmm. the fed could kind of push us over the hill and, uh, yeah. and put, make, make it a, a pretty bad situation. So I'm a little bit worried about that. Yeah. And I saw, um, I mean, zero hedge is, as a source is you, know, you got to really, you know, uh, think twice about how spec, you know, how conspiracy thinking they are or whatever. I mean, sometimes there's interesting information that's real. They get from like the Goldman trading desk or whatever. You know, they talk to traders on the floor and whatever. And um, they said they posted an article yesterday that was saying that um, uh, Powell uh, scrapped his original speech for Jackson Hole just a couple days before because he wanted to, and he put a new speech in or something just because he wanted to, he was intentionally wanted to crash the markets or something like that. I don't know. It's like not that he intentionally, but because he, he wanted to put a speech out that, that would not be conducive to the market rallying further, you know? Yeah. There, and they got it from like some source, you know, anonymous source, I guess, of that's close to Powell or something. So I don't know how truthful it is, but I could see that happening. I could see him like initially sticking with the signal, like being, you know, balanced, like, okay, we might pivot eventually if the data continues to look okay. And, and, but him being convinced, like the market's already rallied. If I do that, maybe the market rallies into another bubble and we can't have that. Who knows? But it's just mixed signals. I feel like we're getting, it's just hard to, hard to yeah. trust them. And markets hate uncertainty. I mean, yeah, like, I, I, th I think if we knew kind of with certainty, what the level of the hikes were going to be and when, um, you know, markets would have a lot easier time kind of digesting that and, you know, move accordingly. And we'd, we remove a lot of this crazy, crazy volatility from the system that, that we've been seeing in markets lately. So, um, yeah. even if it is kind of bad news, it, it wouldn't surprise me if we get like a, a rally when, if there's some sort of language on, we're going to pause here for, you know, X number of months and, and, you know, just see what the six month trend of inflation looks like or something like that. Um. I, I think like some something like that would be a really good signal to the uh, you know to, to markets that the Fed it really is going to be data dependent and not just be like be of so afraid that they're gonna you know be the, the 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 watchmen that let inflation get out of hand for the first time since the 70s. So it, yeah, it does seem like they're they're more concerned with that kind of legacy thinking than than necessarily their uh, what really is the, the right economy. But I also think they, they genuinely are concerned, mm -hmm. but I just think they're, the metrics that they're looking at are all backward looking. So yeah. it's, it's problematic. Yeah. And, and again, I don't know how many people, I still don't get why so many people reference the year over year inflation mm -hmm. metrics in this type of a scenario. Like it should be month over. I don't know. I, I, am I, I feel like not enough people think that the month over month inflation metrics are way more important than the year over year comparisons at this point. Um, because when you see and look in the press or you see people on Twitter comment about it, even people that I respect and think are intelligent, too many of them are referencing this like 8.4% or whatever it is, like 7.5% year over year inflation. And it's really about the month over month metrics in my mind. Like that's what everything should be dependent on going forward. Like, 
I don't know why I, I somehow I, I must have that wrong or other people are have that wrong. I don't understand, but I, to me, it feels like the month over month is like the signal and the year yeah. over year is the noise, you know? So uh, I completely agree with you on that. I mean, it's like, like we know the year over year is going to be something close to like an 8% because like we've already, yeah. we've already lived the laws through, of averages. Like, yeah. First. Yeah. So like what matters isn't like, well, how September of 22 compares to September of 21, because we know from October of 21 through, you know, August of 22, there was a lot of inflation. So like that, that's baked yeah. in already. Yeah. So really all that matters is that one incremental month. So I, I think that's definitely the thing to be, um, you know, watching. Cause I mean, I know the, the uh, August figures were higher than people were expecting, but if, if you look at the month over month changes uh, on like a graph on a, on like a 12 month graph, um, it's still too high, but like, you know, the, uh, July and August were certainly like a, a very noticeable step down. Um, yeah. so I think as commodity prices continue to, to, to drop, um, that'll kind of help continue to drive those, those, uh, you know, month over month figures lower. Um, but you know, I, I do think we talked about this last week, housing could be kind of a delayed inflationary yeah. force that makes its way through the system. Yeah. And I see Yashu in the YouTube comments saying year over year referenced often because the Fed's goal of 2% is a year over year metric. That's true. But maybe they should up, maybe we should equate that to monthly and say the Fed's mm -hmm. month over month goal. I mean, when it's 2%, there's seasonal adjustments and it's like in a normal seasonal, like month over month might be 2.2% versus the next month, 0% or something, you know. But um, when it, you're, you went through like a big inflationary change like we have, I feel like the it, we should be annualizing the month over month. So uh, twenty zero point two percent increase month over month should be looked at as like, oh, we're now inflation is at two point four percent annualized rate or whatever, you know. So I think um, just people yeah. the headlines trick seem to deceive, you know, the signal from the noise in a lot of ways to me. Yeah, in, in normal times, <clears throat> I think year over year is a great you know, metric, it's probably the right way to look at it. Cause, cause then you take yeah. out seasonality and that sort of thing. And, you know, if you're around 2%, that's good. Uh, but when you're f four times over your goal, um, I, I think it matters a lot more and you know, you're going to be about four times over your goal. It matters a lot more what the kind of marginal move month to month is as opposed to the, the year over year. So I, yeah. I think, you know, eventually of course year over year is going to make more sense, but for where we are yeah. right now, to me, it just doesn't month over month is a lot better metric. Yeah. Yeah. And so we'll talk about Tesla in a second, but one other kind of macro development that a lot of people in the Tesla community and the people in our community are curious about is cryptocurrencies, right? And there was kind of a historic thing that happened uh, in the last week was this big Ethereum merge that's been getting talked about for years, really, but it finally happened. Um, and Ethereum and Bitcoin both have kind of drop it didn't seem to yet do much for the the price of ethereum i guess people are staking their ethereum now or something to earn some yield or something or they're committing to staking their ethereum that's the theory so it builds uh you know lessens the supply for people buying ethereum or uh, yeah what well, man tell us about the, the the merge and what your thoughts are of this yeah so um you know, we did speak about this a couple of weeks ago. Essentially, this is a huge, very technical, very difficult problem uh, for Ethereum to, to kind of move from a proof of work to a proof of stake system. So um, they had been planning this out. They've been doing all sorts of like, you know, test merges and, and the merge itself actually went very smoothly. I think it was last <clears throat> Thursday night or maybe into into Friday morning, Eastern time. Um, middle of the night, it actually occurred more or less flawlessly from from everything that I've heard. Um, but I think the the headlines, as you pointed out, are just that you know the Ethereum price has, has dropped pretty precipitously after that. It was around like seventeen hundred or so, kind of leading up to the merge, dropped down to I don't know around thirteen hundred dollar levels. Uh, Bitcoin has dropped as well, but uh, the, the drop from Ethereum was certainly more impactful. So uh, certainly possible that there's been some you know institutional or like hedge fund kind of front running of, of the trade and getting out. That's that's definitely possible. Um, you know, I actually got out of, of a small, uh, somewhat small Ether position, uh, closed like over 50% of it just this past week. Um, and, and really primarily just because I, I think the opportunity- It's on like a I'm, personal level, yeah. Yeah, on a personal, personal level, we don't yeah. Take not in our fund for sure. in uh, cryptocurrencies. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, go on. No, that, that's, that's good to point out, but- um, um, like I, I, I'm kind of like cautiously optimistic on on Ethereum in the long term, but um, 
like Tesla just has so many more near-term catalysts in my mind. So conviction level is just so high there and was able to kind of take advantage of some tax losses, which will be helpful this year for avoiding paying any taxes. Um, yeah. But so, yeah, I mean, it really did go well. I think, you know, this is a, a pretty impactful thing in the long term, you know, a lot of like ESG focus. We're, we're skeptical of ESG here at Good Soil, but uh, I yeah. do think it's like there are a lot of people who take that seriously, that that think the electricity consumption is a serious issue with, you know, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which use proof of work. Um, and this one move, uh, which I think this is the most interesting stat I've heard about this, was essentially overnight um, on last week, um, this this move from proof of work to proof of stake on Ethereum reduced the global electricity consumption by half a percent. So um, I think it was less than that, wasn't it? Zero point two percent. I thought it was zero point two. I don't know. I, I saw this in a tweet. So like you know, take it with a grain <laughs> I think of salt. It was, it was like in that, the, in that it was country of Austria or something. Yeah, I thought it was it was it was small. It's, it's smaller than Bitcoin, was, but yeah. it's I don't know. Sure. So so. <laughs> A large yeah. amount of electricity is now not being consumed that was previously. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. I follow, um, you know, when I look at the prices of Bitcoin, I'm, I'm worried about the flippening, you know, the so-called flippening yeah. happening. You know, I still have a, a small percentage of my net, you know, percentage of my net worth in Bitcoin that I bought a long time ago and I've held it and I'm holding it indefinitely, you know, because I think if there's a digital gold, I still think it'll be Bitcoin. Um, and so... I watch Bitcoin and Ethereum and I'm, I'm a little worried about the flipping happening ever, but I don't I don't know if that's going to happen. But I'm always looking at the market cap relationship between the two of them yeah. and the relationship of the market cap to me is what I follow. And for much of the last few years, Ethereum has been around a third of the market cap of Bitcoin. But recently with this, you know, Ethereum, you know, the 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 speculation around and the talk about and Ethereum functionality with NFTs or smart contract, whatever, it just seems to have been creeping up. And it was creeping up to be like almost at one point, two thirds. I think it was, it was well over one half of the market cap of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And the reason I look at that is it's irrespective of whether Bitcoin's at 30,000 or 20,000, you know, they, they all kind of move in line. So I'm trying to measure the relationship between the two. Right. So, yeah. So, so right before the the merge, Ethereum was you know a, a decent, significantly above half of the market cap of Bitcoin, and so I was like, oh, this is interesting. I wonder what's going to happen. And now it's dropped, and Ethereum is you know significantly below half of the market cap of Bitcoin. Um, so there's definitely some weakness in Ethereum specifically relative to cryptocurrencies because of the merge, in my view. Um, now is that weakness temporary because of speculators that are you know, crowding for the exits. I don't know. I don't know what the reason is, but it didn't go up. I think a lot of people that I had talked to in the recent, in the last six months or a year about this, they were getting excited about this, thinking that like, oh, this merge is, you know, get ahead of it, get, get some now because the merge is going to make the, you know, Ethereum go through the, you know, they're making big bets on this and it just hasn't come to fruition. It hasn't been a, a major deflationary <laughs> event either, but it's just, it's a little bit of a nothing burger, I would say, in yeah, terms so of value far. valuation for Ethereum versus. I, I mean, the, uh, it, so you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I think leading up to the merge, the, 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 the ETH to Bitcoin ratio did increase, but then immediately afterwards it decreased. So I know we're probably pretty close to where we were, I don't know, maybe a month or two months ago. Um, you know, I know the the kind of Ethereum maximalists out there, which which I, I don't count myself among their uh their kind, but um their their view mm -hmm. is that the the the, the merge created a, a permanent change in the structural flows of, of um of the currency. So all the miners that you know had electricity bills to pay, they would be forced to sell their Ethereum to you know pay those dollar-denominated or, or fiat currency-denominated bills. And so now all those people are not going to be selling on a regular basis. And so there's this kind of increase in structural flows, which over a long enough time period they believe will kind of result in in an increase in in the price and ultimately a flippening. And I know a lot of them actually are like short Bitcoin, long ETH as like a way to kind of hedge overall cryptocurrency exposure, but kind of bet on the, the flippening. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that 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 happens either, honestly. Um, yeah, but it's it's interesting. <laughs> I'm definitely going to be, be kind of an interested observer to see where this goes from here. I, I think ultimately Ethereum Ethereum's risk is if they don't provide enough like value, uh, if, if not enough like dApps are, are developing on the network and, you know, generating the, the gas, then um, I think ultimately like that's going to be what what makes the price go in or up or down so 
Yeah, yeah. I see a lot of good comments in the uh, YouTube live comments. Uh, one from uh, Planet Musk Vlog saying, Instagram consumes more electricity than the Bitcoin network. <laughs> I wonder if that's true. I'd have to dump, fact check that, but that, that, <laughs> I could see that being possible. That's po I don't know. It seems possible. Maybe you combine Facebook, Instagram, and 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 TikTok, you know, and they do. Or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think TikTok would do more because it's more videos and is isn't that more like energy to send things of versus, you know, who knows? But, uh, and then I see another good comment from one of our longtime favorites, Dan Marge. If there's a digital gold, it means earth has turned into a Mad Max type of planet. I think you have a point there, Stan. Um, but I also think, uh, a utopian, uh, type of planet could, could lead to a digital gold potentially too. Um, so it, dystopian or utopian, either way, I think could lead, you know, something very futuristic could lead to a digital gold. It could be yeah. very Mad Max like though. So yeah, we'll go I back mean, to a lot of these one, questions later too, but, um, there's a lot of good comments. Anyway, what were you saying, Matt? Well, maybe one, one last thought to round out the, the <laughs> cryptocurrency discussion, because no, that's, that's certainly not our, our main area of focus, but, um, it, it does seem like all, all the Bitcoin maximalists and, and Ethereum maximalists, like cryptocurrency, uh, folks in general, they had their moment because inflation got run away. <laughs> like, yeah. So you would yeah. think it was like, okay, finally they were right. Like the the governments of the world kind of got ahead of themselves, printing, printing too much too money. Much money. <laughs> and like everything that they warned us about happened and and they drastically underperformed. So so yeah. it's like, like the whole, you know, any, any cryptocurrency as a store of value or as an inflation hedge uh, or as like a, uh, like, you know, digital gold. I think all those... Um, narratives have been pretty significantly uh i don't want to say they've been invalidated but they've taken a pretty massive beating um so mm -hmm. maybe in the long term those those will pan out but i think it's it's pretty clear in the short term they're very they're like like gary black has always said they're they're uh high risk assets that are they're like the growthiest of the growth stocks yeah yeah and the last thing is i see david Kasman says a new ethereum production like the production of ethereum has been cut by 90 percent post merge. So if that's true, you would think that the price of Ethereum should shoot up, you know, supply comes down 90% demand. If it's somewhat steady, then the price goes way up, but it, either demand has been cut by 90% as well, or um, I don't know, it will, we'll see um, if that's true. Yeah. Yeah. The, the analogy, a lot of the, the people in this uh, community talk about is like, it's a Bitcoin happening, but it's like three of them back to back to back. Um, mm. and so if you do go back in history and actually look at those charts mm. of when the happening actually occurred, there, there yeah. usually was a slight delay between when that happened and, and when the, you know, actual price increase happened. So that's a good point. I mean, none of this is, mm. you know, knowable really. We'll just, I, I just think it's really interesting and we'll um, keep an eye on it. Definitely curious to maybe, see how it goes. Maybe now is the time to buy Ethereum. Who knows? You know, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but it's, it's possible. So Let's go on to the Tesla stuff. Uh, we talked about macro market a lot in the beginning because macro market, as every Tesla investor knows at this point, drives the Tesla stock price to a large degree, you know, because if you're just looking at Tesla stock, you're going to see the stock go up or down a lot late in the last year, down mostly a lot of times and be like, what's going on? Why is it down 10% in the last week or whatever? And most often it's because the entire market's down 10% in the last last week or whatnot. And so we talk a lot about macro market in the beginning because it's just, we have to understand and be aware of what's going on in the macro market to, to really put into perspective the movement in Tesla stock price. Um, and so now let's just move on to Tesla though. Tesla stock, uh, well, first full self-driving beta, you know, wide release is coming in the next week, it seems like, um, or it's going out to 160,000 new subscribers, 60,000 new, I couldn't quite tell what he meant by that. Um, I, I think it's 160,000, um, total. So 60,000 new people. No, I think it's 160 incremental. Um, really? I could be, I could be wrong on this, but, um, he, here's my thinking. So he, he indicated that it would be, um, all people with a safety score of greater than 80. Um, mm -hmm. I, I ran a poll recently just saying like, cause it seems like to have a, a score below 80, you got to have some pretty serious, you know, um, issues on a regular basis um because like even when i was being aggressive with my driving i'd get like one drive with a score of i don't know like 85 or 84 or yeah, I had a couple yeah bad occasionally drives, yeah. like if i had a short drive with like um, a forward collision warning or something like that sure maybe you get a 60 yeah. but um yeah for, for the most part it would average back up pretty quickly so i had a thesis that like 
there, that's a very small percentage of the overall FSD purchasing population, which would have a score that low. So I ran a poll um, of the respondents who actually bought FSD and had a safety score. Uh, only 7% had a score of uh, below 80. Um, so wow. to me, that indicates that it's, it's actually like wide release to everybody other than, you know, call it the 7, 10, somewhere in that neighborhood, worst, pers you know, bottom rung of, of drivers, at least as assessed by Tesla safety score. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, um, then it seems more likely. So you'd have, you had 100,000 before based on, you know, the assumed take rates over how long of a period of time and how many were in US and Canada. Um, my, my estimate was that wide release in US and Canada would be around 300,000 people. So 100 plus the 160 is pretty close to that figure, especially if you have some amount close to the 80 or that, that are sense. below the 80. So you know, it's it's definitely unclear, and I know a lot of people will, will probably disagree with me on that point. But I do think it's it's likely that it's, um, or at least my my view is it's more more likely than not that it's you know two hundred sixty total. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, that's. I mean, are they going to recognize that revenue, or what? How does this work with accounting, Matt? What are your yeah. thoughts? I know you're. So you've been looking into this. This is like my favorite nerding uh, <laughs> topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I do think they'll recognize it. Um, Zach Kirkhorn, okay. I think it was Q3 of last year, uh, made some comments uh, essentially saying that uh, it's still a beta program. So at that point, it didn't make sense to recognize additional revenue. Um, but they, when they delivered the functionality that was promised within certain geographic regions, they would start recognizing that revenue. So mm. the question becomes, okay, will they this would presumably count as wide uh, wide release to us and canada right you're going to more than 90% of the people who have bought it um so if that's the case some some maybe quick napkin nat math is like you know 300,000 people if you assume the, uh, like an average purchase price of of 8,000 but half of that was held back um then you've got like 1.2 billion essentially of deferred revenue that they could recognize just on that that group of people so uh, somewhere in that ballpark seems like the amount that they could recognize. But then the question is, how conservative do they want to be with their their kind of interpretation? Because, um, you know, they, they haven't delivered it to everyone. They're still calling it a beta, even though it is in wide release. And what if somebody is does unsafe driving, for example? And so this is a point Bradford made. Um, you know, let, let's say you've got beta right now, but then you're just looking at your phone and you get your five strikes or whatever it is and they take beta away. Well, do they unrecognize that revenue or like That's how would they? Point. So the accounting on that is a little, I've never seen any product where you could revoke the access yeah. that you've already granted. So there's, there's, to me, it seems like 75% likely that they'll recognize, you know, some significant but they still, portion. They still call it beta. Yeah. Right. And he said like. As long as it's beta, they're not going to recognize. But maybe they're waiting for the full. I don't know if it's called FSD beta. Do you think there's an argument to be made? They're just not going to recognize until they stop calling it that. Maybe and they actually I, call it FSD or something. That means that they're confident that it's ready. That would be an extremely conservative um, interpretation. Um, mm -hmm. So it's possible that that's what they do. Um, mm -hmm. But I would I would just be surprised if if. Mm -hmm. um, they are are that kind of conservative on it. So. Because what if NHTSA, I mean, just as a, 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 you know, we like to look at the opposite points of, you know, we're not all just, it's important to be, you know, we're bullish on Tesla, but it's important to like look at contrarian takes that, you know, may not be good for Tesla. Like what if NHTSA orders Tesla to recall FSD beta, mm -hmm. then does Tesla have to unrecognize the revenue? Do you think they're worried about that? Do you think they're not going to do it until they know that's not an issue? Yeah, they might. I mean, there there's an ongoing investigation right now um, where <laughs> mm -hmm. that's a possible outcome. Um, yeah, so that's what I understand. Uh, an another, you know, um, maybe way to look at this is like, do they have some sort of warranty reserve for that sort of thing for, you know, mm -hmm. either people who they have to revoke access from or if they, um, you know, just just uh, to, to account for like the, so some probability of, of um you know, a, um, a recall, a recall. Thank you. Mine's blanking there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like, I don't know, it, it really just depends on how aggressive do they want to be. I think they're, they're well within their, their rights from an accounting perspective to recognize that revenue. I think, you know, they have to make some assessment on the likelihood of either a recall uh, or, you know, some level of people. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like you would, 
take a loss on those FSD revenues or what? I, the, that particular question is pretty unlikely or is, is pretty murky, but it's such a small percentage of the overall, you know, over a billion dollars of deferred FSD revenue that it's kind of like rounding error in my mind. Mm. Um, mm. So I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, now, what, I know you're, you're not like the uh, the accounting type, but what, what do you think they, yeah. they do from here? Yeah, I think they stay conservative and, and don't account. I mean, I feel like almost every quarter, there's some amount of people that think, oh, this is the quarter they're going to do it. This is the quarter. The end of last year, you know, James Stevens had a good point and thought, yeah, the end of the year is when they'll do it. And it feels like every quarter they still do not recognize, you know, the, that revenue. And so I don't – I still am – thinking that it's going to take like a major change of some sort, whether it's call, maybe it's it's signaled when they stop calling it FSD beta is my thought. Like, and maybe that doesn't happen until end of Q4 or sometime next year, you know? Um, But this NHTSA recall, the investigation, I know Missy Cummings, everyone's aware of who that is. I think she was ordered to recuse herself from all like Tesla related investigations at the beginning of the year. So, you know, but she's still an influence. So, but there's still people in NHTSA being lobbied to like, you know, be hardcore uh, against Tesla, I think, in terms of um, recalling FSD and stuff. So Brad Munchen, who's a guy you've talked to and he's on Twitter and I respond to one of his tweets. Tesla Q. Yeah, Tesla Q guy. Um, But he's been Tesla Q like his whole, as far as back as we can tell. And, but he's very convinced that NITS is going to, or not very convinced. He seems like it's very likely or very significant chance that Tesla gets recalled by NITSA. Now, granted, this is coming from a Tesla Q guy. Um, but do you think they're like, what would you put? I, I would love to talk to someone who's kind of an expert in the NITSA stuff like this, what they think the probability is. You know, is it 10%? Is it 50%? Like, what are the experts who are not biased as far as we can tell think the chances are of a recall of FSD beta by NHTSA? I mean, have you have you talked yeah. to anyone who's kind of on that front at all, Matt? Or have you heard? Yeah, so, you know, I, I did, you know, DM with, with Brad about that a little bit. And, you know, his... His his point of view is that it's 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 likely to happen, uh, but uh, but he's I'm, Tesla Q, yeah, he's Tesla, he's Q. biased on the other and, side, and he's like, sure. you know, they keep running into parked cars and like emergency <laughs> vehicles, and and I'm like, that was like 2017, 2018, 2019, like the functionality is so much improved yeah. since then, but like that, I don't know if there's been a NHTSA investigation in history where you're investigating events from five years ago. And the current product that you might recall is like a thousand times more capable than that. So yeah. how how does NHTSA even handle an investigation like that? Like what? Yeah. To what? And extent the recall. You... A lot of times the recall is just like this function of your automatic drive is messed up. Recall it, and Tesla's is like, okay, we'll put a code fix in that. Now it has to stop fully at stop signs. Done. Recall pushed out to everyone. You know, and it's still working now. This it just stops fully at the stop sign instead of rolling through them. So I don't know if a recall means they'd have to. No, take off autopilot entirely. There no, might just th- be specific things they tell them to fix right away or something. Yeah, I, I think it's a lot of wishful thinking to think that you know that would be like like a recall. Wishful recall. by the Tesla Q. Yeah, wishful, wishful exactly. Tesla. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's that's what I meant to to say. Yeah. We we don't we don't quote Tesla Q very often on here, so we got we got to yeah. be very careful with our words. Um, but yeah. like you know the the kind of thinking, and then there were I guess two motorcycle accidents recently, something like that, and so you know. Brad was like, they're just running into motorcycles left and right these days. <laughs> but like, I, I do kind of have have faith in what Elon was saying that, you know, these these agencies are assessing risk and that's like what they're doing. And so ultimately the stats went out on this. So you can have a thousand anecdotes of, of Tesla doing things unsafe. I mean, I could create a highlight reel of like the my FSD beta doing things that are pretty awful and, you know, put it with some Dan O'Dowd style footage and make it look terrible. But when you look yeah. at the system on the whole of like you know, FSD beta plus the safety driver over the course of like 100,000 test drivers for, you know, weighted average, maybe six months or so, um, like the fact that we don't have any serious accidents to report, like the data speaks volumes, I think. So um, yeah. I, I think ultimately the true safety of the system will win out, you know, for better or worse. And based on my understanding of, of how the system has performed so far, it's, it, I would find it very hard to believe that they would recall this in, in like a, any sort of meaningful way other than like they did a recall to make sure that it stopped at stop sign. So like maybe there's more tweaks like that. Um, yeah. But I don't yeah. think it would be like you you have to not have this functionality and give your Prove that it stops. 
Yeah, prove that it can stop for the emergency vehicles now on the road and, you know, fix that, re recall that in the software. And Tesla's probably already fixed that by now. Well, well, you know, that, like that issue in particular was highly related to radar and like sensor yes. fusion and like which which issue do you have? They don't even use radar anymore in the autopilot no. system. So it's like they could, yeah. what, what if like the solution was NHTSA uh, issues a recall on Tesla's radar system or something like that? Like, yeah, it would almost be comical to be like, okay, cool. <laughs> like, yeah. good work, NHTSA. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, I know there's a lot of Tesla Q people like excited, waiting for NHTSA to come out with some announcement of a recall any day now. You know, so yeah. so if that does happen, you can expect headline news: Tesla to drop, you know, potentially five percent or something temporarily, and then you know, I don't know. It's just it's just I, one I, of those kind of headline articles that could hurt Tesla a little bit temp for a day or something. You know. I, I do think that's more likely next year than, than this, though, because I think the investigation was elevated in June, and generally, uh, they they take roughly a year, a little bit less than a year, I think, on average. So, um, okay. to me, it's not necessarily a short term risk, but it does kind of linger <laughs> out there. I see. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll we'll stay tuned. There's going to be lots of weird, like just I was just looking at my uh, news feed on Interactive Brokers, and the Reuters immediately fire Tesla in the headline and PG&E is now included. So Tesla fire powered by PG&E facility shut down on highway one in California. Uh. <laughs> so some mega pack, you know, they've delivered like thousands of these mega packs by now. And one of them caught on fire happens to work for PG&E and it's shut down highway one. Oh my gosh. News national headline news. Reuters runs with it. Probably enough people clicked on it to make it worth their while. And I wonder when that's going to stop. When is the, the words fire and Tesla in the headline going to be going to stop being like the focus of, of these news headline, these news editors, you know, like how many years can this go on for? I remember when it first started in 2013, when the first Tesla fire started happening, it was crazy, but nine years now we're still Tesla <laughs> fire in the headline. You just think, think of any kind of headline you can and put those two together. And it's like, crazy i don't know and crash fire headline you know tesla it's yeah just... i th i think it's going to take you know just viewership <clears throat> continuing to go down for those because it's just yeah. playing clicks now and i think more and more yeah. people are starting to realize that they don't want that it, it's just like it's so stupid though it's like you can imagine the next headline is going to be like fire at, at spacex starbase and it's like well yeah that was a static <laughs> fire it was a test <laughs> like they were trying to do that <laughs> yeah they were testing eight engines at once now instead of seven or whatever yeah, yeah. but like so, you know exclamation points and like yeah just some crazy but there'll be a lot of people that click on it you know a lot of people yeah. need your click on it i don't know why so yeah i guess um we'll find yeah it's been going on a long time so the next thing that we have on our, our agenda sort of you actually drove the latest fsd Point ten dot sixty nine dot two, right? I mean, did yeah, you get that two just a couple two. days ago? Yeah, I yeah. just just uh, yesterday uh, I, I got it, and that's the one that looks like it's going out to wide release. So I did see on Twitter today a lot of people are getting FSD beta for the first time today. Did you get that okay. update yet on, on yours? I'm gonna check right now on my phone because I didn't check this morning. I haven't driven my car this morning yet, and right now I do have a software update. Yes, I'm gonna do start downloading it now so yeah. I can. Uh, Maybe that's a, a PSA for everyone watching. Go check your Tesla app. See if you have an update. Even if you don't have beta yeah. yet, you might have beta just waiting for a download. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah. What was your impression of it? Anything different, noticeable that you could tell? Um, versus not that really. one? So I had I had like a, just a 30 <clears throat> minute drive or so. Kind of. I, I took it back to some air areas that it had previously had issues with. And it seemed like it still had had issues with those with those same areas that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago. So we don't necessarily need to rehash it. But yeah, no, yeah. to me, I mean, it's it's definitely a, a pretty big step forward from from where it was, you know, a month or two ago, wh whatever it was before the dot sixty nine release. Uh, but there there certainly are still some some issues that um, that seem like they're they're being worked on, and it's it's been surprising. I mean, Elon's been very kind of vocal about how much stuff that they're they're going to be releasing in the next couple of days and weeks we didn't have this on our agenda but did you see his tweet about um like uh aut summon actually smart, smart summon, summon and auto -park? yeah 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 i mean it, that's going to be really useful the auto park feature you know you go to a crowded parking lot costco or wherever like it's such a pain sometimes to find a parking spot well now you just get out in the front and you press let it auto park and it'll find you, you, you have to trust it obviously yeah and, 
you know, but once you watch it and you, if it does it a dozen times perfectly well, and maybe you start trusting it where you don't have to think about it and you just, it's just very convenient then. And yeah. uh, you just get out and then it finds a parking spot for itself. And then it comes back to you when you're ready. That That's the dream. That's a big dream yeah. of like making some like that's like pseudo robo taxi in a way. It's like mm -hmm. pseudo robo chauffeur in a way, like, you know, the parking lot smart summon and smart park. I think that's that's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you ever use smart summon right now? I've used it in the beginning when it was like when it first came out and it was sort of like a parlor trick. You know, I could show people yeah. like, look, I'll get my car to drive to me. Look, I press this button. It holds on and it backs <laughs> out and it comes. But then people in the parking lot, if they're walking by. They look at it weird. And like one guy was like, talked to me once, like, you know, you drove a little too close to my son. And I was like, oh, sorry. He, he was just wor worried about the technology hitting his son and stuff. And I even though I can stop it if it gets yeah. close to someone, you know, so I just stopped using it. It was just uncomfortable. But I think um, I'm looking forward to try it out again. Have, have you used it? Yeah, I mean, kind of, kind of same. It, it seems like a parlor trick. Like I've had it actually once where it was like useful, where like it was raining and it actually came to like pick me up at the door and like got to the right way. But probably, probably five other times I've used it and it like just like stops driving in the middle of like blocking a bunch of traffic or like in the worst possible area, you know. So mm. it's it's like not worth the stress of, of using right now. Um, mm. but they haven't updated it in what, like two years, something like that. Mm. Um, so I'm just very curious to see when they do release that, that new version, is it actually good? Cause like, I'm imagining yeah. like, you know, just getting, imagine getting dropped off right now and just trusting the car to go park itself. I mean, based on its yeah. performance on smart summon, I don't trust it at all. You know, so I think yeah, yeah, it would yeah. take me a little bit to like, see it, to get comfortable, it, like, see it handle some situations. You gotta watch it, situations to babysit it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think initially it, the first few times. It'll, the, the way to break it in is like only at the parking lots where there's not a lot of foot traffic and not a lot of people coming in and out, like, like an office parking, an office building parking lot, not at lunchtime when people are leaving to go to lunch or whatever. It would be like mid morning when like the parking lot's pretty full and you, you need, you know, you just drop the, drop yourself off at the front where you're going to walk in and use it and watch it when there's like no one, you know, there's no cars coming around because everyone's in working, but maybe you let it find its own parking space on its own and you watch it do it, you know? And I feel like those will be the initial times to kind of get comfortable with it. And then slowly you do it more when there's some foot traffic around or other cars moving around and, and over time, it just, it's going to get better from there. Yeah. I mean, that's like, I was trying to think to myself realistically, like, how how much would I trust the the current um, like product suite? So I, I like right now I know for sure I wouldn't trust it to do Smart Park. But if I yeah. see this update and and see that that would be you know maybe that would help me get some confidence. But like I was thinking, would I actually sit in the back seat on the highway with how good the autopilot system is? And I'm I'm not really sure. But like, what do you think? Trying to trying to hone in on like how close are we to robo taxis with you with the current state of of just like autopilot on the highways, would you feel comfortable like being all the way in the back seat? <laughs> I, I, um, not yet. No, yeah. I would not be yet. I, you know, because I have that story in my mind of like the emergency responder on the side of the Tesla running into the emergency responder. And I would want to be able to see if that rare thing is going to happen to me and move it out of the way. If, if yeah. Tesla didn't fix that yet, you know, I, I, they probably have fixed it. I'm sure. But, uh, or just you know, something just, small in the road. Like I've seen that a couple of times. There's like something that looks like debris that the Tesla doesn't move yeah. out of the way for. Yeah. 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 Sitting in the back seat, um, and letting the car drive itself. I would not be comfortable, uh, doing that. That's a good question. That's a good, like litmus test. Like how close are we to level five or not? Like for even the highway, you know? Um, yeah. That's cause, cause like yeah. By all accounts, it's a really good system. But even you and I, who are like very, I think, um, bullish on like early adopters, autonomy and, and stuff, early adopters yeah. and tech enthusiasts, like we're not comfortable enough yet to get in the back seat. So that's that's what I'm trying to think of when when seeing like, okay, how close are we to autonomy? Like, yeah. hopefully the the rate of improvement really picks up from here. It certainly seems to be. Uh, but I think we need like several months in a row of of like. I've had zero safety interventions and I would personally feel comfortable sitting in the back seat, even though I'm not required to yet. Like to me, that's like you said, a good litmus test of, are yeah. we, are we on the verge? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, effectively a lot of people and me, I've been guilty of this in the past. I've in the past before the latest F the one thing about FSD beta is it forces your eyes to look on the road. Uh, anyone who hasn't had it yet, once you get it, you can no longer be lazy 
on the yeah. highway and, and look at your phone and text message or Twitter on your phone because it'll beep when uh, it's time for you. If you're if it's if, if it sees your eyes and even with sunglasses on, it sees your eyes look away and it beeps and you don't want five of those beeps in a row because then you get a strike and you don't want like three strikes or you can't use it anymore. <laughs> so um, so so. You know, before the FSD beta, I, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't have FSD beta that do the same thing on autopilot where I was so comfortable. I was actually looking at Twitter and I would get, look up every few seconds, look down, look up or my email, I'd read an email and I type something, but look up, but I'm, I'm clearly like not engaged in what the car is doing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it's a long straightaway with like no traffic and I just know it's just like going straight, you know, and, you know, it's in a way. I'm already taking the same risk as sitting in the back seat. It's just not for a long stretch of time as if I was actually sitting in the back seat. You know what I mean? So it's, um, it's, 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 it's interesting, you know? Yeah. I feel like back seats, like that's a whole other level. Cause it's like, you could see the, the situation coming, but you're like 10 seconds of crawling yeah. forward away from <laughs> like scarier. Like, I yeah. think I just, I just had this thought right now, but like maybe there's some, option like on the tesla app whenever it is autonomous to just be like stop there's an emergency or something like that you know like you can stop yeah like like auto steer maybe it just like turns on the flashers and pulls over to the to the side of the road as quickly as possible so maybe that's yeah. a, a way to handle this or, or something but um yeah i don't know we're, we're a ways away i think yeah yeah evan glansman says i wonder how it look with everyone driving a tesla and trying to smart summon their car to the in the front of costco <laughs> that's probably not far away i mean here in northern california there are so many teslas on the road it's insane like yeah i mean this is the the hot bed of of teslas like you know i'll be at a parking lot and half the cars are teslas once in a, that's not surprising that happens occasionally you know so um i couldn't i could see that happening you're yeah, taking delivery of one more, right? I don't think we touched on that yet. <clears throat> yeah. No, I'm I'm finally I've had for like two years my Model X on order. O over two years, I think now. It keeps getting pushed back. First it was like nine months out, then it was like when I was getting up to it, then another three months, another three. So the last like four quarters or five quarters in a row keeps getting pushed back. And now I actually delivery a delivery appointment tomorrow to pick up my Model X. So it's the original price, you know, that when it was offered, I think. So it's like $25,000 or something less than as if I was buying it brand new right now because I got in two years ago at the pricing before all the increases. Um, so I'm excited. I'm getting a long range. I'm not getting the plaid. I'm just getting a long range with full self-driving, getting the bench in the back this time so that I can fit more kids in the back seat. Um, yeah, I'm super excited to take delivery tomorrow of that. Yeah. 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 That's, that's really interesting. And it's, it's one of the things that some people have talked about as a potential headwind for ASPs this quarter is uh, we've heard anecdotally from at least one other person, which I don't know if they want to be named or not, so I, I won't say, but um, that also has like a similar, like $25,000 discount on, on their model X. So that could be a little bit of ASP pressure. I think it's going to be relatively small in the grand scheme of things relative to the, the price increases on the full lineup that are, that are kind of flowing through right now, but um, maybe just some reason to not have, super enthusiasm around you know asps and, and margin th this quarter but yeah. yeah it's exciting that they're finally delivering those because that's i mean two years is a long time to wait yeah it was a long time i wonder if there's and, and a friend of mine who's an you know an old neighbor or so a family friend they're also supposedly supposed to get delivery before the end of this quarter as well for their model x although they haven't got their delivery appointment yet and that sort of happened the last few quarters with me. I felt like, oh, I'm only a few weeks away from getting delivery. And then they move it back three months suddenly on my app. And I'm like, oh, I got to wait another quarter now. So I, hopefully he gets his delivery appointment the next week or two as well to get his Model X because him and his wife put their order in for their upgraded model or their refreshed Model X two years ago at the same time as us. So if he gets it too and the other person you're talking about and where I'm, I'm getting it, that's like three in it. Those, maybe there's going to be... Maybe there's a meaningful increase in Model X deliveries this quarter too. In that case, you know, instead of ten thousand, maybe there's twenty thousand Model S and X delivery. I mean, what has it been the last few quarters? It's been like it's very been small, like 16, 17, I, I think. Maybe so not. Maybe quite it'll 17. be twenty five or thirty thousand eventually again. I, they think it could be a hundred thousand in total. That's what they're ramping it up to, right? For yeah, S and so X like twenty five thousand per quarter, I, th I think, is the installed yeah. capacity. And and Troy's numbers, I haven't looked at his latest uh, figures that went out this morning. Uh, but he he was uh, estimating a, a pr pretty in substantial increase uh, in Q3 relative to Q2. Um, mm -hmm. 
So I, I think it might have been like 22,000, 21,000, something like that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that would be a, a pretty big increase overall. And, and so maybe even with this, you know, $25,000 price increase on some portion of the of the Model Xs in, uh, that, that, are, that are going through, um, you know, maybe the increase in overall volume of deliveries offsets that even. So, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's going to be interesting, interesting uh, delivery numbers sure. that come out. Yeah, we're like two weeks, less than two weeks away from getting the actual delivery number. What are we like 12 days away from getting the the pr production delivery numbers? It's exciting. Yeah, I'm really fast. excited. I'm very excited yeah. for this, this, yeah. uh, the next three months, really. Yeah, and then we'll go through uh, the earnings model uh, in more detail again once we have those numbers like we did last week. We went through a preview of what we thought Q3 earnings would be. We'll go through it in more detail on on uh, on this Tesla Tuesday live stream and spaces. So let's yeah. move on to Tesla Twitter. I mean, we'll just touch on the Tesla Twitter stuff. I mean, the, the, everything is coming. Like, I know everyone's tweeting about it. Gary Black, there's this professor, uh, Eric Talley, who puts out this probability distribution um decision you know tree of what could happen and you kind of walked me through because i couldn't understand it the first time i looked at it um but there's all these range of outcomes of uh obviously that could happen here and it seems like high according to this guy his pr probability distribution is you know what was it, like 80 percent or something pretty high percentage that elon has to buy twitter um one way or another right yeah yeah so it was a pretty interesting kind of decision tree of like uh would you know twitter be um on the hook for like uh, a breach of their contract terms or would elon musk and it was like essentially elon musk is much more likely at least in this professor eric talley's uh decision tree of of being in breach and so then if that's the case then what are the the potential remedies and and you know could could he get away with just like a fine or or will they enforce the deal and it seems like at least from his perspective it was highly likely that the the terms of the original deal would be enforced um so so that was something and then you had an interesting question that you asked to another i think it was another law professor another yeah. legal commentator um yeah I, I asked him you know how would you uh adjust these he's kind of a law professor who um at pepperdine and he, he i'm trying to pull up his twitter uh profile here from my profile but to get his name exactly but uh he was saying that um, he's kind of taken it upon himself to be a commentator on the Tesla Twitter um, case as sort of being a defender of Elon Musk as opposed to like someone biased against Elon Musk because almost all the commentators, the legal commentators on on this trial are appear to be biased against Elon, which is something we've recognized as well. And I think most people who are Tesla fans or Elon you know, uh, supporters recognize that everyone's just assuming Elon's trying to manipulate the legal system or he's trying to get around something or he's just not being, uh, he, he's being disingenuous on things just to try to get yeah. a lower price or try to get out. And, um, so he came in and he's like, yeah, I'm going to comment. So I asked him what he thought about the decision tree and, uh, Robert Anderson. So Prof professor Robert Anderson, I tweeted him and he uh, he he has to look at it, but he's going to come back with his own probabilities uh, for that decision tree. But he, you know, he, I think he th agrees with the all lay of potential outcomes. But maybe his probabilities would be like sixty percent. Elon has to buy. Who knows what he'll come well, back and, with? But and I think his concern too, or maybe not concern, but his his point was Elon probably has more of a likelihood to to win on appeal or have some favorable ruling on appeal. Uh, specifically because of like the the whistleblower case. So um, I mean, yeah, if, if that's true, then like to what extent does that uh, get baked into into the the judges, um, you know, rulings? I've heard some commentators say like they don't want to tell him that he has to buy, you know, what is it like forty two billion dollars or something like that? Like essentially enforcing yeah. a, a tens of billions of dollars in in you know uh, in damages, but then he can walk away with it legally through an appeal or you know through some other system. So that wouldn't give a whole lot of certainty of like deal certainty if that becomes a new precedent. So I, I've heard some commentators say that you know concern of what would his outs be after this ruling could actually impact the ruling itself, uh, which is kind of an interesting thought. <laughs> And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm certainly no legal expert to know whether that's, you know, true or likely or not, but it's at least an interesting exercise. Yeah, absolutely. 
And maybe in the next week or two, we, we find out more details. Uh, and the trial itself is supposed to be like five or six days. And doesn't that begin in like a couple of weeks, a week or two or yeah, it's like set to be yeah, soon. It's, it's in October. I thought so October presumably yeah. pretty soon. Oh, there's a deposition next week. I think September 26th or 27th. There's like an Elon Musk deposition. And so some yeah. people think there'll be a settlement before the deposition or something. So yeah, that was Gary. Gary had made a similar comment that yeah, most often if there is a settlement it's it's because like people don't want to get deposed mm. so um it, especially with elon and like his time being so valuable i can imagine he doesn't want to spend yeah I know, it would be like 18 courtroom over the course of a couple days yeah. so yeah, um, yeah it wouldn't surprise me if we do get a, a settlement sometime relatively soon and, and i do think that'd yeah. be good news for the stock yeah for tesla stock yeah Mm -hmm. It would be good news, especially if it's a discounted price, because the, the delta and the discount is there's some amount of cash Elon has left over that he would likely put back into Tesla stock uh, as well. So not only removing uncertainty of what's going to happen here, but, you know, actual buying of Tesla stock again by Elon from shares he had sold initially to get ready to finance the, Tesla, the Twitter deal, worst case at full price, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, um, let's touch a little bit on a couple other things. I mean, uh, Rocket Lab and Roblox, we haven't touched on in a while. A lot of our followers, a lot of our listeners uh, like to hear what we have to say in those two names. I mean, Tesla is by, by far our highest conviction name. We personally spend the vast majority of our time studying Tesla and the businesses that make up Tesla. It's a big conglomerate. Um, but we also have other, we have three other names we talk about publicly, Lemonade, Insurance is InsureTech Play, Roblox, and Rocket Lab is sort of second place to in the space industry to SpaceX. So you, you're going to actually go to the Rocket Lab Investor Day tomorrow in New York, right, Matt? Yeah, yeah. So they're they're giving, it's a kind of combination <laughs> investor day and um, like Neutron up to their, their kind of next generation rocket. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Um, and hopefully I'll have a chance to, to meet some of the management team and that'd be awesome if we could, uh, meet Peter Beck even, and, and just hear a little bit about, uh, the longer term vision for the company. I mean, one of the things that, um, we get really excited about is thinking of the long-term potential for, uh, for rocket lab to have like a, uh, starling type of, of like, uh, constellation that they provide services back to earth on and this is some, mm -hmm. something that is part of their plan but they've been uh, a little bit light on the details of like exactly what that would be uh, but it's definitely like their whole motto is we go to space to improve life on earth um, and mm -hmm. that's a lot different from from spacex's mission which is like to like leave earth and go explore and like you know go beyond the stars. Get to mars yeah. and stars and like so like a lot of people commonly ask us like what don't you think like spacex is just going to eat uh rocket labs lunch and I think first of all, there's there's room for two good launch providers, even if one is a lot more expensive than than the other, um, mm -hmm. just because you want to have strategic redundancy. Like governments definitely want that, and even private launch contractors want that to some degree. Yeah. Um, but you know, too, like they've just got different missions. Like Rocket Lab's not going to, they really intend to uh, be focused on providing value back on Earth. So, um, yeah. I, I'm it, to the extent they can share details around that, I'm I'm really interested. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if you believe the space industry is going to be a monopoly and just SpaceX only, then yeah, Rocket Lab, why would you invest in it, right? It's it's not going to be part of that monopoly that SpaceX is, for example. But if you believe the space industry is going to be gigantic and there's room for multiple players, then to us, Rocket Lab is a no-brainer as a second place to SpaceX. Distant second place, but a clear second yeah. place to us, you know. Um, I mean, their market cap is two point less than two and a, it's like, it's just over $2 billion as we're talking right now, you know, SpaceX's market cap is a, almost a hundred times bigger than that at this point in the private markets, you know? So rocket lab, a distant second place, we mean, like it's a distant second place, but we think it could be more than 1% of SpaceX's market cap. Ultimately, you know, we don't think it's mm -hmm. going to be a 99% monopoly of SpaceX and doing everything space. And rocket lab does a lot more than just launching things to, you know, to, to orbit they 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 um are building satellite constellations they're providing uh satellite services software solar mm -hmm. arrays for the satellites you know reaction wheels react, they're doing space wheels. cleanup and yeah yeah they're doing a lot of things and so if you believe the space industry is going to evolve into like a, a trillion dollar plus industry within a decade or so which we believe um, then to us, there's a huge runway of growth and total addressable market for Rocket Lab to potentially 
get a hold of. Um, so we're excited. So it's a longer term play. It's like a it's like investing in a venture capital fund almost, but it's publicly traded and it could take years to play out. That's how we think of it. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see what kind of takeaways you have from that. Uh, we'll touch on that maybe next week about what you learned from yep. from there, and if you got to ch talk to Peter Beck or not, and so forth. And then um, the other one we I want to touch on before we go to Q and A, I guess, is Roblox. Um, that stock has taken a hit, obviously. Uh, I think you had mentioned to me yesterday that it seems to, you know, the market took a hit, but also Roblox announces their uh, monthly user data and bookings data on the 15th of every month for the previous month. And so it was, uh, the bookings was down a bit um, for August versus July. And I guess at the same time as the NASDAQ crashing, I think like three or 5% on the same day in, or the day before. So it was like two consecutive, you know, 10% drops and, and Roblox almost. Uh, so it's come down from close to 50 bucks down to, you know, I think it's 36 or $37 right now. Um, but we're still, I, I looked, they had their investor day presentation last week. It was like three and a half hours. I got around to watching the rest of it yesterday. Um, and I'm very, uh, I'm still bullish. I don't think the bookings number, while it's down year over year percentage, or it's not down year it's over year. Up, yeah. It's, yeah. Year over year. It's up. That's the metric to watch because there's seasonality. Kids go back to school more so in August than, you know, half of August kids are back. A lot of kids are back in school. So they're not spending as much time on Roblox to spend money and book things. And so there's a seasonality adjustment between July and August because of that, obviously. But then year over year is the other metric. So the seasonality, take that out. What's the previous year, August versus this year's August. And it's only up quote unquote, 7%, only up 7%. And so that's a little like, all right, it's a little, okay, I'll, let's see what happens. But then I listened to the investor day and and their CFO, Mike Guthrie commented on that specifically and said, you know, he, you know, they reported a 7%, but he wanted to get the information out that, you know, the dollar has been very strong in the last year compared to other currencies. And they're a very global company. And between last year's August and this year's August, um, if the dollar hadn't been so strong, and the dollar just stayed the same, they'd, they'd actually, that took off 400 basis points. So the bookings revenue would be 11% up year over year versus 7%. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. You have to kind of read between, you have to really find the nuances and things to understand more. But, you know, the takeaways I had uh, from, I mean, did you have any takeaways from the, the metrics or what, before I kind of go into some takeaways I have from their investor day? No, what, 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 I didn't actually watch the investor day yet, so I gotta, I've got so much stuff on my on my watch list. So why don't why don't you uh, keep going yeah. and I, I'll touch on this quick. Mark, so yeah, we got to do some Q and A and a lot of questions about Tesla and stuff too. So I'll hit a couple quick things on the Roblox investor day. So a couple things I thought were interesting is their head of marketing, Christine. I can't remember her last name, but she she made a really good case, and I believe it that every brand in the world will have a presence on Roblox within three to five years, and I believe that. Okay, and then. Um, the bookings growth year over year, um, it's, it's, you know, 10% double digits is where they want to be. If you look at the previous several months, you know, there was a few negative months year over year because that was affected by the, the COVID, the, the, the COVID, you know, when COVID lockdowns happened, there was a very high uptick in usage of Roblox, obviously, because kids were at home. So kindly now they, now they have the year over year comparisons post COVID. So the, the year over year comparisons going forward each month to me is much more meaningful now because mm -hmm. now it's all post COVID year over year comparisons, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the 17 plus age demographic is growing much faster than they hoped for. It's like 40% growth year over year, something crazy like that. Um, and APAC, you know, is growing. Asia Pacific is growing 40%, very growing. The big thing really though, is, you know, they're in continue every month to hit new daily active users. I think 59 million was the daily active users for August. So they're growing on that. And it's not like a lot of bots, like on Twitter, you know, they, <laughs> they know how many bots they have. They don't have all these bot users. I'm sure there's some people trying to create automated Roblox users, probably maybe in the future will be a bigger issue, but you know, 59 million daily active users. Um, and then the immersive advertising, that's the new business kind of, uh, that, that's the real, I think, thing to watch is what that is, is they're going to allow, they haven't really allowed this yet, but they're going to allow the studios and the developers who are creating the popular games or experiences within Roblox to not only make booking money from bookings of 
the players buying in-game items, but they're going to allow them to now make money through immersive advertising. So they can get brands into their experience to put a portal or a billboard or something in their um, experience and get paid by the the advertisers or the brands that are advertising yeah. in their experience. It's a whole nother revenue stream to be opened up now. And so Roblox is in discussion as to how they haven't, someone asked in the Q and A, like, how are you going to split that with the, um, the, the developers versus Roblox? What cut is it going to be like 30, 30 or 30 or whatever, you know? So they're still in discussions about that. So I think that'll be firmed up soon and it'll be a big part of Roblox's earnings starting probably Q1 next year. Um, so I'm excited about the immersive advertising revenue stream that could get turned on for Roblox too. I, I do think that's a really underrated aspect of, of, of the business because like, you know, Wall Street loves to look at the current, you know, what are the current metrics? Like, what are the bookings? And, you know, of course that's, you know, important to some extent, but I think what's much more important for the long-term valuation is like, how how can they turn on these other revenue sources? Because um, mm. like, like to, Roblox's valuation doesn't frankly make sense if it's just like a platform for kids gamings and they buy Robux and buy stuff with it. Like, like what, what really gets is exciting about the long term and which has so much more potential is these immersive experiences, like you're saying. And like right now they're doing a lot of handholding with brands and like, you know, using their kind of internal resources to develop this. But like the plan is absolutely to have the brands be doing this stuff in, in house. And so if you, you, you start looking at some numbers of that and say, OK, well, if, if they don't have the cost of doing all this development and the brands, there's, you know, 10 or 100 times more brands doing it in the future than there are now. And, you know, they're getting a cut of these these like, you know, advertising revenues. That's like a way more exciting business model, I think. And it, yeah, but it, it kind of works with the whole flywheel of, of what they built. Um, yeah. And I was a little bit worried last year, just a little anecdote before we get to, to Q&A. But like, you know, Chipotle has been one of the early adopters of of, of Roblox and Mm -hmm. They had this big promotion around Halloween of last year. And then the site went out. There was like a four or five day <laughs> outage or something like that. And I was like, oh, yeah. maybe Chipotle is going to be like feeling a little bit burned by, by doing that. But like, no, they're they're like more active than ever. So I think mm -hmm. it's a it's a good sign that um, even though the, um, um, you know, they had this kind of hiccup last year, you know, brands still continue to be increasing. Like I'm seeing more brands on there, not less. So it's yeah, good momentum. Yeah. The big picture story, uh, very good. But the big picture story for Roblox I see playing out is: is this thing a fad or a trend? Is what people are doing on Roblox, what kids are doing, and now seventeen to twenty-four year olds is growing super fast. A big part of their, I think it's like a third, seventeen and over is like a third of their users now, or something. Yeah. So is 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 what they're doing is what everyone's doing on Roblox a fad or a trend, right? And the difference between a fad is like it peters out over time, and a trend is like it's continuing to grow and grow and grow. And it's going to continue growing in the future. I think it's a trend, and if it's a trend, is there anyone else better positioned that's doing it better or in a competitive way to what Roblox is doing in terms of the users, the flywheel users? Like who else is doing? I don't know anyone. I don't see anyone doing it vertically integrated like Roblox is doing it. You know, you have Unity software, you have other things, adding components or Minecraft, some people argue, or maybe Fortnite. I don't know, Fortnite, but there could be multiple. So I don't know. I, I think this is a big part of the future as the decade goes on. I see my kids growing, lots of kids growing up with it. And it's a big part of their life. I don't see it not becoming a big part of their life. And we'll we'll see how this plays out. But the immersive advertising is uh, is kind of a new revenue stream. And it could be similar to when Facebook first went public. It kind of dwindled. And then when they turned on their monetization and advertising, the stock took off. Who knows? Maybe something similar happens with Roblox. We'll see. So um, let's go on to uh, Q and A. Um, for we have a lot of questions. Matt, do you have any questions kind of queued up for Tesla? I'll read the first one from Evan Glansman here. Question: Do you think some of Q three earnings is being front run, causing Tesla to outperform the markets recently, or is there some other reason you believe Tesla has been performing so well lately? It's funny you asked that, um, Evan, because Matt and I were touching talking about this last week, <clears throat> and. Last year, at the same time, we were in the same, we had the same concern and we had a big options bet on going into like November or whatever. And uh, it, the, the stock was rallying and we're like, oh, great. This is working out beautifully. Let's close out these options, you know, right the day before earnings report and then buy them back the day after earnings report because I'm sure there'll be a 10%, 5%. It's a buy the rumor, sell the news event, just like it always is, you know? And so we tried to time it like that. 
And then we just missed out because the stock kept rallying after the earnings was really good, like it was rumored to be going into that Q3 earnings report of last year. And we missed out on a huge amount of upside because we tried to get cute in time, you know, sell the news event. And so part of me is concerned, like you're saying, Evan, that, but then last year, I remember last year and we had the same concern and it didn't play out like that. It just kept going up. Any thoughts, Matt? Yeah, I, I think it's so hard to know in the short term, um, but where I get excited is like, you know, I'm, I'm looking at like 2023 earnings and what's like a, a somewhat conservative given the macro environment multiple that you could apply. And that's giving me kind of like an implied share price in, in like the Gary Black range of like 500, 550, something like that. This is not at all investment advice, like at all. I don't I don't really think people should be playing these short term moves with a significant portion of, of their of their wealth. But just from from like the pure fundamentals of the company seem so undervalued that um, even if it is like, you know, some amount of front running, I think the the earnings, you know, in Q3 and, and even more so in Q4 are, are like so likely to surprise even the like the the most optimistic funds out there like or, or institutional investors that I think it, you know, we, we could have a, a little mini re-rating uh, you know, just as the pe people realize that that Tesla is just way more profitable than, than they've given them credit for. Um, and then if you couple that with like, if there actually is significant improvement on FSD functionality or like whatever is revealed at AI day is like material and the market finally starts getting excited about like Tesla's AI prospects, um, yeah. you know, th there could be even more, you know, kind of room. So uh, it's certainly possible we could have another, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news. Um, I don't pretend to know how that's going to gonna pan out, but uh, just on the fundamentals of the company, I really like, you know, buying at these levels, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And as we're talking uh, the last hour or so the, the the markets come down significantly the nasdaq uh is down you know close one and a quarter percent i think it was close to flat now and now tesla's turned negative just barely a quarter of a percent but it was up you know percent and a half earlier so you know just intraday movements that are you know you can't really make a whole lot of it just kind of gyrations in the market nerves whatever jitters before the fomc meeting tomorrow is my view um, but it's it's you're just commenting on it for those listening that aren't aware of what's going on but are interested. So, all right, next question. Let's see. From Tesla to Dirium on Twitter, while the IRA seems like good news, I keep, whenever I see IRA, yeah, I keep thinking individual retirement account. I'm so bad with acronyms. Irish while Republican the, I, Army. Yeah, yeah. Why the Inflation Reduction Act seems like a like good news. Do you think the government will actually be able to fund these obligations. Yeah, I think some someone just published a note from I don't know if it was Morgan Stanley or somewhere, but like saying that there's concerns about now about being able to fund these obligations. And I think everyone in the Tesla Twitterverse knew this. We've been talking about it. Like, <laughs> how is the federal government going to afford millions of Teslas? This kind of rebate on it, like it's crazy. Like they don't know what kind of debt they're getting themselves into putting this in, in place. It just it's it's great for Tesla, obviously, but. The government had no has no idea, like, you know, later this decade, how many EVs are going to have to be subsidizing with this. I mean, I don't I what's going to happen. Is the government going to have to change this or what are, is this going to be like a big expense for the government? I guess. I mean, what do you think, Matt? I, I don't think there's an out for them. Like they're <clears throat> it's definitely going to be more uh, more of an impact on the budget than they were forecasting because, they, you know, they were essentially assuming linear forecast growth. I don't remember the exact number, but it was some like absurdly low quantity of vehicles in 2030 that they were expecting. With I think, I'm pretty sure it was like less than a million vehicles that they thought that this would be applied for um, on top of like similarly small um, assumptions on like battery stationary storage deployed and that sort of thing. So I, yeah. I definitely think this is going to be like a multiple higher of like a deficit impact than uh, they they are projecting right now. Um, but I think the government is just going to fund it the way that they always do by by printing more money. So um, I don't think it's going <laughs> to like I think what's most likely to happen is like in three years time, like people will realize like, whoa, like we're giving Tesla all these like subsidies and that's not right. And like it'll yeah. probably make like a lot of negative press and like. The AOCs of the world will be like, like, why are we like giving corporate welfare to like, we'll have like all these things that we've <laughs> the been biggest hearing. company in the world. Yeah. Which the richest man, time. you know, we're giving biggest like, company a trillionaire because we gave him all of these federal tax credits. Like yeah. there's gonna be a lot of fun. There will be. Yeah. Um, 
but like I, I don't think they're they're gonna just like not honor that because this is legislation that you know went through Congress yeah. and was signed by the president. So in in order to change that, you need to go through that same system. You can't just like a new administration comes in and some executive order and it's gone. Um, this, it's it would have to be a different mechanism. So I, I think it's yeah. kind of here to stay. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Next right. question is from T Lake one 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 on Twitter. I would love to learn why FSD works so well in some areas, but not others, even with well-marked roads. You know, that's a mystery to me too. <laughs> I, I, I wonder if some cars, th- Matt, you did that test with Dirty Tesla where you both were the same car driving on the same road. I wonder if there's more people that should do that, like FSD beta testers, just to see like, just to see like, is certain cars going to react differently because their cameras are not calibrated properly maybe, or I wonder how much that could be affecting certain things. I don't know. Any thoughts, Matt? Yeah. I I mean, I I don't know. I mean, to me, I think this is like one of the mysteries of AI is like, you'll never understand why it did some weird thing. I mean, just yesterday on my, on my, uh, drive that I did with, you know, 69.2.2, um, I was driving in my neighborhood again and it, it like, um, was just going very slowly through this stop sign, which was like very clearly marked. There was not a lot of traffic. It was like a very <laughs> basic road, 25 miles an hour. And, you know, it has a little tentacle that shows you where it's going and it like couldn't figure out where yeah. to go. It was like, going, it was like <laughs> what is the, what is confusing about this? Like, it was just, <laughs> so I, there, there's something just buried within all the, you know, the layers of neural nets that we, we don't understand. But I, yeah. I think over time, what, certainly what I've seen in my own experience is those, those weird cases get, you know, smoothed out in future updates. That's kind so, of uh, i I've never heard it referred to as a tentacle before. That's a, it's kind of a <laughs> mischievous word. I feel like that's like a, an evil word, like a, is you it? know, octopus has tentacles <laughs> to come get you or something like, I think maybe it might be Chris from dirty Tesla that, that uses it. I don't know. I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard that somewhere else before. I didn't coin that. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. All right. Any more? Uh, should we? Let's, okay. Let's maybe we'll ha- maybe do one more question, and then we we end the YouTube stream. Okay, we'll end the YouTube stream and take some interaction on on uh, Twitter Spaces. So if you want to chat on Twitter Spaces, um, you can start raising your hand, and we'll get to you in a minute. But first, we'll do this question from YouTube, which is uh, <clears throat> TLF said forty six eighty cells are not cobalt free, and the walls are three times thicker, reducing density. The limiting factors, TLF. Is this, factor, yeah. yeah, is this a concern? You know, I'm not an engineer on the batteries. I, I listen to Jordan and others who comment on this stuff. It would be a good question for him. Um, I think Farzad, I don't know if he's listening here, but I think Farzad is actually talking to Jordan soon. So I don't know if Farzad, if you're out there, this would be an interesting question to post to him uh, if you're talking to him later today or not, or maybe you're yeah. What do you think, man? Any thoughts on this question? Yeah. So, you know, I'm certainly no, no battery expert either, but, uh, the, the one thing that has surprised me is the, um, like the, the very first 4680 teardown that we saw, which was the one that Jordan did, uh, with, was it UC Berkeley? I think, um, mm-hmm. they had such a hard time getting through that, that outer wall. It was just incredibly thick. Uh, and you could like see the guy like really struggling, like using yeah. all of his, his might to kind of cut through that. Um, but then in the latest version, I think, uh, Monroe and associates just took one apart, uh, and they commented how the, the wall was actually thicker or, or, or sorry, less thick, um, than, than what was in that, in that, uh, limiting factor video. So it, to me, like, we're not even close to kind of an optimized 4680 cell. Um, there were also like changes to like some of the, the laser etching that, that was done. And I, I don't remember exactly what that was, but, um, like, like even in the course of a couple months, we're, we're seeing pretty rapid iteration, um, the, not only just on the production, which we're certainly expecting as they, they're working on like improving the yield and, and getting higher production out of the Cato road and, and the new facilities that they're building. Um, but like the, the designs themselves are changing just at a rapid pace. So I, I'm not even close to, to kind of getting worried yet. Um, you know, this is taking longer than expected, but, uh, really it's, it's just the long term is what matters. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll end the live, the YouTube live stream here, but we'll keep chatting on Twitter spaces here. Um, all right. Well, thanks YouTubers.